Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. You were, you were mentioning uh, recently, uh, a couple of minutes ago, about um, the Sunday Sabbath yes. and uh, talking about not buying groceries and so forth. Yes. I'm a newspaper carrier. Pardon? And I'm a newspaper carrier. Yes. And I spend a lot of time preparing and delivering papers, particularly on Sunday. They're yes. huge. All number right. one, is it wrong to do that? And number two, is it wrong for the people that are reading it? Because it takes a lot of labor for Sunday papers. Yes, I understand altogether. It is a, uh, it is what is happening today, and it does cause somebody to be a paper carrier, uh, someone to distribute, to fold, and uh, and put a rubber band or something on the paper, and then deliver it. And uh, actually, if you're going to follow up out the lo the law of God, that Sunday is a day not for our uh, uh, to do our thing, but it is a day to be dedicated to the Lord. Then it is uh, a task that uh, a job that a true believer should not take. We have to deny ourselves. You know, as we live in this world, and remember. It's a very sinful world. The world could care less about the Bible. They could care less about it. On Sunday, for example, is a, a good illustration. All of the grocery stores are open. All the uh, department stores, the uh, Walmarts and what have you, they're all open. It's a big shopping day. And uh, everybody around us uh, is using it for that purpose. And... Uh, on the other side of the coin, all the parks and the uh, places for camping and fishing and so on are all doing a land office business on Sunday, particularly during the summer months. And what about us true believers? Can we get caught up in that? The answer is no. No, the Bible says, let me read again. Let me read again what God says about that in Isaiah chapter 58. And Isaiah 58, and God, in, from the context, we know he's talking about the Sunday Sabbath. He's saying, uh, if thou, verse 13, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Now, you see, uh, when you are uh, passing out or pa working in the paper distribution business on Sunday morning, uh, is that doing it for the pleasure of God? The answer is no. No, it is for your own uh, pleasure of trying to earn a living, trying to earn some dollars. And so you just have to deny yourself and say, well, that's a job I can't, ha I can't have. And, and totally, totally can understand that. But anybody who subscribes to a Sunday paper they is should, causing someone to do that. They should really uh, wait till Monday to read it. But somebody still had to do it for Sunday. Pardon? They had to, they, somebody had to put well, it together you, for you, Sunday. That's when they had to pick it up to get everything. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's very difficult. I remember earlier in my life, I tried very hard to subscribe to a paper and ask them, please don't deliver on Sunday. But it's very difficult to make that kind of arrangement. And uh, so you, if, they, if they're going to insist on delivering it, it doesn't mean you have to read it. But, I mean, if somebody subscribes... Somebody has to do the work to put well, the paper together. You know, on. You, you know, let me make a suggestion. What we have to start with is me. Now, you have a problem in that you are a, uh, you have a job to deliver papers. And so you have to, uh, f uh, don't, don't figure out the sin in somebody else, what they do with that paper. That's their problem. Your problem is what is, what is my relationship to this in that I am working to deliver it. 
And so don't worry about the other people. Just worry about yourself. Okay? okay. Thank you okay. for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Campion, are you suggesting that we don't read the newspaper on Sunday? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it may be that that would be a wise thing to do because the newspaper is not really guiding us into anything spiritual, is it? I'm not, I'm not making a big point on it. I'm trying to help this young man, but, but uh, it is true. It's pretty hard to justify sitting there for a half hour reading the newspaper and saying, I am now doing the pleasure of God, isn't it? That's pretty yeah, hard it, to it, justify. It sounds like you're becoming like the Pharisees. They kind of invented their own ideas as they went along. Well, you, there are gray areas, of course, but we have to bear in mind that uh, we do have God's command, and God has given us instruction for Sunday. He has given the instruction that it is a day for, for spiritual activity, for being in the Word of God, and for passing out tracts, and uh, that is of declaring, sending forth the gospel. And as we grow in grace and we become more and more concerned about being obedient to God, these things begin to nag at us a little bit. You know, well, uh, this is a practice that we have always followed in our house, whatever it may be. And now I'm beginning to sense that maybe it isn't quite as, as uh, uh, holy or right as it should be. I think, for example, this, what I talked about a little earlier, you know, when I said... We don't want to have Bible conferences over Sunday. We've had many Bible conferences over Sunday, and I have to admit it never really disturbed me a whole lot. But somehow uh, with this conference, as I uh, see the blessings that have come upon us, and, and as I think about this more seriously, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable scheduling another conference over Sunday. I, I, I suppose this is all a function of growing in grace, that we become more sensitive to the holiness of God and have a greater desire to want to do His will. Even though we may be running upstream, we may be called a, uh, an oddball or whatever. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Okay, and thank you for calling and sharing. And you know, today... <laughs> This is the other side of the coin. Today is the day when the Bible uh, uh, is, has lost its authority. There are more and more things going on in the quote-unquote Christian world that are contrary to the Word of God than ever you could imagine. And, and we get caught up in that. We get, we get brainwashed by that. We think that that's... That's, uh, that's acceptable just because a lot of people are doing it who call themselves Christian. And if anything, it ought to make us more and more suspicious about any of these things. Wait a minute. Are we really now being faithful to the Word of God? And so it ought to make us more and more sensitive to what, what, uh, what our lifestyle is, whatever it may be. ago you were talking about divorce in the Bible. Yes. Now I'm wondering at what time is it possible to leave your your partner for abuse or infidelity or other kinds of malicious acts? Well the Bible says what God hath joined together let not man put asunder. And, uh, and in other words when two people become married they are joined to each other. And, uh, and that's, why, that's why it is so important that people are carefully, are, are exceedingly careful before they take the step of marriage because it's not something that, can, uh, be, uh, that you can separate from. Now, in our land, for example, if there's physical abuse, we have the law of the land to give some protection. But that doesn't mean that gives you the right to divorce. When it comes to infidelity, the Bible speaks about forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. How often? Seventy times seven. Uh, and so it's uh, really, 
really, uh, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, serious. It's a very serious matter when two people marry. Well, let me ask you a question. If your partner decides they don't want to be with you, what can you do about that? Well, now the Bible explains that in 1 Corinthians 7, First verse 15. Corinthians. If the unbeliever desires to di divorce, you have to let them divorce. You can't keep them from that. But then you have to follow the rules that follow, and that is you're not to marry again uh, anyone else. You're not to think romantically toward anyone else as long as your uh, spouse who has divorced you is still living. Well, how does that work? I mean, if your partner is the one that leaves and the, not you, it, how are you supposed to kind of throw out your happiness well, it just of means, your partner leaving? It just means that God has laid down certain laws, certain rules for, to protect the marriage institution. And uh, the law is that of God is that you marry once. You don't marry twice unless your former spouse dies because death uh, is the only way that marriage union can, can be altogether broken. And so it means that if you... If your spouse divorces you, it means that you now must remain single if you're going to do it God's way. Now, incidentally, the Bible also emphasizes how we husbands are to live toward our wives. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And that means that we don't love them because they were so lovable or because they cook well or because they this or that, or we think they're very beautiful at the time we got married, and now they don't look so beautiful any longer. We, uh, we love them because they are our wife, and we lay our lives down. That is, we don't think, first of all, what is good in it for me, what is my pleasure, what is what uh, I expect out of marriage, but we try to think, what, would, what will my wife expect? Well, how can I give her as much security as possible. How can I show her that I, uh, I'm, I, uh, my number one thinking in our marriage is, is uh, as I try to serve the Lord, is that I am being faithful in every aspect to my wife. And we husbands can go do an awful lot of improving, every one of us. And that can make a big difference in a great many marriages. Thank you, brother. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download Open Forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to FamilyRadio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Hi, uh, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, one of your earlier calls, you had um, mentioned that the keeping of the Sabbath, and this is in the book of Isaiah, that it is, it is the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. Yes. But if we really look into what the Sabbath is, it is Saturday. Well, so in how the can old, we make excuse that? Excuse me. No, excuse me. In the Old Testament, uh, when it is talking about the ceremonial laws, it is. It was Saturday. We read in Exodus chapter 31 that he gave the seventh day Sabbath as a sign to Israel to indicate that the Lord is the one who sanctifies us. That's why in the, when he gave the Ten Commandments in uh, Deuteronomy 5, he says, uh, I brought you out of, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I brought you out of Egypt with a high hand by my power. And therefore, you are to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. What did that have to do with the seventh-day Sabbath? Well, uh, being brought out of Egypt was a picture of salvation. And the se keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath is a picture of salvation, that we're not to do any work to get ourselves saved. It all has to be the work of Christ. And then God summed it all up in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, where he names a number of the ceremonial laws that we no longer keep, like 
like uh, uh, laws concerning meat and drink and holy days and Sabbaths. That would be the seventh day Sabbath and indicates they are a shadow of things to come. And so we don't keep laws concerning meat and drink anymore. We don't keep, uh, we don't offer burnt offerings or blood sacrifices, nor do we worship on Saturday. Now, on the other hand, if you go to a church like the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is not the gospel of the Bible at all, it is an, has an authority different than the Bible alone, it is the Bible plus the writings of Ellen G. White, there you have been thoroughly uh, taught to that the Seventh-day Sabbath has to be kept, and that is because it is a different gospel. It, it, that gospel does not understand God's salvation plan at all. Well, I, I don't understand it. it. It is one of the Ten Commandments. How can we say that? I mean, the other thing it, that we say are part it, of the old law, we don't really comply with, but we have to comply with the Fourth Commandment. Well, except that we have to understand the Ten Commandments. And how can we understand it unless we read the whole Bible? The Ten, the ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill. Now, can you tell from that statement how to understand that? Does that mean I can't kill a fly? Uh, does that mean that a judge can't sentence someone uh, to the electric chair if they've, uh, if they've killed a man? Does that mean a, a soldier can't kill a, the enemy in battle? Uh, just what does that mean, thou shalt not kill? And you have to read the rest of the Bible carefully to finally determine that that means thou shalt not murder. Now, the fact is that when we read any of the commandments, we have to look at them in the light of the whole Bible. And when we study the fourth commandment in the light of the whole Bible, we find that it actually is a ceremonial law, not a moral law. It is a law that God gave to emphasize that we're not to work for our salvation. On the other hand, the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, they look upon it as a moral law. They don't read all the verses about the Sabbath. They don't understand the Seventh-day Sabbath, nor do they understand the Sunday Sabbath. And they're kept from understanding it because they have a different authority. They have a, the Bible as their authority, but they also have a more recent authority, which carries very heavy weight because it's the uh, visions of Ellen G. White and the writings of Ellen G. White. And, uh, and so uh, uh, they're, they're totally betrayed by their authority, and they're convicted that they are to keep the seventh-day Sabbath, and yet in so doing, they are in total rebellion against the Bible. And it all begins because they have widened the authority under which they want to be uh, beyond what the Bible is. John, John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 7. Yes, John 3, verse 3 and 7. Let's turn to that. John 3. We read, uh, Nicodemus has come to the Lord Jesus asking uh, the question, uh, 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 actually, he's asking about salvation, really. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, that is truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 7, uh, Marvel that I, said, uh, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Uh, for the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, what is your question? So then, um, when you, if you go to heaven, you've got to be born again? Yeah, you see, here's what Christ is... Uh, you're asking a very important question. Before we are saved... Every human being is a two-part personality. We have a body and we have a soul. 
uh, and, and of course our body is uh, kept alive by the breath of life. Uh, in that way, we're different from an animal. An animal has a body and the breath of life. When the breath of life is gone, the, body, the animal is dead. But a, an animal does not have a soul or a spirit essence. But mankind does. Now, because of our sinful nature, both in body and soul, we are in rebellion against God, and we are uh, subject to the uh, wrath of God because every time we commit a sin, uh, we're breaking the law of God. And the law of God declares that if, if we sin, there is a penalty to pay. In other words, the predicament of mankind is super horrible, super horrible. We're all sinners by nature. We're all under the wrath of God by nature. Now, if that was the end of the story, uh, then, then everything would be super, super, super gloomy. But there is a giant shaft of light if we could receive a brand new resurrected soul, which would be like being born again. It would be like starting all over again. No, our body didn't change, but in our soul, we are, we are brand new. And, and the Bible teaches that when we receive a brand new soul, that is when we become born again, we no longer have any sins. We, uh, God, Christ has paid for all of our sins. And in, more than that, in our new resurrected soul, we've been given eternal life. And more than and so that when we die or when we come to the end, we can instantly go in the presence of Christ. And so everything is super wonderful. Now, the whole question is, how do we become born again? And we have to wait upon the Lord. We, we can't get ourselves born again like some, many, many preachers teach. Oh, yeah, tonight I can get you saved. No way, no way. They are, they've got another kind of a gospel, a man-made gospel. Uh, when we are listening to the Bible carefully, and that's the only place we can find truth, we know that God has to do the whole work of saving us, and we have to wait upon him. And, and yet we know that he saves through his word. That is, faith, the Bible teaches faith, cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the Bible is the word of God so if I know I'm not saved or think I might not be saved I, one thing I'm going to be doing is listening or reading the word of God persistently because I want to be in an environment where God can save me if that is his plan secondly as I read the word I'm going to be praying, Oh, Lord, help me to understand some of this. Oh, Lord, help me to be more faithful to uh, and obey thy word. And, uh, and I'm going to be learning more and more about God. I'm going to be learning more and more about what a sinner I really am. And, uh, and I'm also going to be learning about God's mar marvelous salvation plan. And at the same time, I can be praying and begging God, and God wants us to do that. He doesn't discourage this for a moment. I can begin. I can be beseeching the Lord, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I want to be your child. I want to serve you. Now, none of these things is a guarantee that I'm going to get saved, but, uh, but God has chosen certain ones to become saved. He's not a respecter of persons, and... I could just as well be one of those he has chosen as anybody else. And so I just wait upon the Lord. Wait, 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 and continue to read the Bible and listen to the Bible. Continue to pray for his mercy. And, uh, and uh, who knows, God in his mercy may save me too. And uh, that's the wonderful hope that every unsaved person has. The, no, the only reason I was saying that because remember uh, Saturday, and uh, I was t I was telling you that uh, I was talking to somebody there at the banquet there, and then I was asking them just so my husband would find out that you have to be born again. Remember, I was t telling you that. Yes. And uh, so the lady told him, "Oh, I don't know." She said, "I don't know about that." 
And she goes, I wouldn't think so, and she told my husband that. So I just wanted the listeners to hear what it means to be born again. Yes. And uh, so, I don't know. Thank you so much for calling and sharing. That is a very, very pertinent, a very good question.